good evening in India and a very warm welcome to our speaker for today and all our participants from different parts of the globe. Uh, welcome to our 26th webinar session. As you know, our Association of Asia Scholars, completing 15 years of existence, has brought together the alumni of the Asian Scholarship Foundation, uh, which was based in Bangkok through 10 cohorts of Asia Fellows who lived and researched in another Asian country for up to nine months. And it is this fellowship which helped us to gain tremendous insights into Asian countries where we lived and where we did our research. And that is how we are all connected now through the Association of Asia Scholars, organizing various workshops, conferences, and uh, have brought out several publications. In fact, just on 30th and 31st of October last week, we concluded a very important conference on revisiting Gandhi, an international conference which brought together abstracts from 140 participants with 31 papers having been submitted, and now we are working towards a volume. We also have our flagship journal titled Millennial Asia, which is a sage publication. And this journal is also now 10 years since it started. And we have now three issues a year from when we commenced, it was a biannual. So thank you and welcome to this 26th session again. I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting session ahead because the subject of discussion today is again a very, very contemporary one. And I now hand over to our president, Professor Swaran Singh, to formally introduce our speaker for today and the theme of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rina Marwa. It's a great pleasure. and. Uh... I am a bit delighted and surprised that it is uh, 4 a.m. for uh, Professor Yves uh, Tevagian, and he's looking as fresh as always. Uh, I get answers to my emails uh, at middle of night, and he's now up in the morning as well. So I deeply admire his uh, energy and enthusiasm, which he keeps rubbing on all of us. And we are really looking forward to uh, listening to this uh, very, very uh, kind of foundational lecture for us, uh, the geopolitics of COVID-19 and what are going to be its early takeaways for international relations. Uh, one doesn't need to introduce uh, uh, Professor Tevagya is a very, very uh, famous scholar. Uh, Professor Yves Tivergien is a PhD from uh, famous Stanford University, and he's been later also a Harvard Academy scholar and also Fulbright scholar. Uh, he's currently professor of political science at University of British Columbia, uh, but he's also a great institution builder. So I remember his role in uh, building up the Leo Institute there, building up the School of uh, Public Affairs, public policy and global affairs. So he's now the director emeritus, uh, which is a great uh, prestige for any scholar of the Institute of Asian <clears throat> Research. And of course, also co-director for Center for Japanese Research. Uh, you can Google his large number of publications, uh, his uh, media interactions, his uh, occasional papers. Uh, there's a long list that I have, and I would not like to spend time focusing on, on that one, uh, but I think we are all deeply interested in listening to what he has to uh, say to us today. Uh, COVID-19 in many ways uh, has uh, pushed forward this whole global narrative on shifting from international to global. Uh, so for the first time, we actually have a situation that poses really, really global uh, challenge and uh, never such a challenge has ever happened before. Uh, so therefore, most of the challenges that happened uh, at that scale happened among major powers or their uh, dependent colonies. 
and therefore remained within the domain of international relations. But today we are sort of moving in a direction where it's human challenge, it's global challenge. challenge. And how does it accelerate those narratives seeking to expand the canvas of international relations? Uh, what are going to be the new important sectors uh, as we set a recast of several sectors of human interactions around the world? And how do we redefine international relations from here? I think that is the kind of tone that I sense uh, in today's presentation uh, by Professor Yves Tevagian. And I personally look forward to listening to him. So without much ado, uh, and I believe that all of you can check on Google and you'll find lots of information and in his writing. So I'm not going in much detail about his works, a lot of celebrated works that I have been exposed to myself. And with that, I will now ask Professor Yves Tebergian to please begin his initial exposition and he's going to share his PowerPoint with us, followed by question and answer session. I believe that he's also in demand soon because of elections concluding in several media houses. So let's see how far we can keep him with us because it's just 4 a.m. in Canada. So hopefully we'll get enough time with him today. So over to you, Yves, please begin your PowerPoint. Namaste, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swaran Singh, and thank you, Dr. Rina Mawa, for having me today. So it's a great honor joining you. I wish I could join in person. Uh, I have so much to learn uh, in India and from India. I had the pleasure to visit uh, uh, JNU. Uh, I think it's back in 2014, uh, but not since, so it's really overdue. Um, and I really thank you all for being here. So there is really no problem in terms of competition for time since everybody's sleeping in Canada. So uh, you know, now and then it's very relaxed. Um, I will also add, uh, we always begin our official uh, meeting that we have here in Canada by being on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. Um, so I'm now going to uh, start the PowerPoint. Uh, I will preface this by saying it's very, very hard to, to do this talk because first, we still don't know the outcome of the U.S. election. It's, we know it's disputed. It's going to take uh, several days. Uh, so we don't know the direction that things will take on many of those questions, uh, given that it's a very dramatic choice that there is uh, with opposite direction on many top issues. Um, and then second, even on COVID and the global economic situation and geopolitics, everything is, is still volatile right, and moving. So those are early insights and analytical uh, tools, but um, we are living through history, right? So everyone here maybe is lucky to live through history. Uh, we'll, we'll always remember in future history books about 2020, uh, but it's very early to have a final uh, observation about those things. Um, all right. Um, so this is uh, the title, Geopolitics of uh, COVID-19, and trying to bring uh, you know, key lessons, 10 key lessons, and some big uh, uh, questions and, and observations. Um, so I have a few cartoons first. Uh, the difficulty that every country has currently, everybody is always running behind us. This is a very tricky virus. Uh, full of surprises. Um, we have seen something never seen before, the whole humanity under quarantine, you know, having a lockdown at the same time. Um, this has changed human behavior, including uh, redrawing famous paintings. So the question is, what can we learn uh, so far about long-term impact of COVID-19? Uh, is that a change in the global trajectory and to what extent? Um, and also the second puzzle is why as this uh, pandemic, which has relatively low mortality, you know, if you compare to other pandemics in recent years, um, um, and yet it's triggering uh, one of the greatest economic recession and great geopolitical confrontations. Uh, so why is it, what, what is it about this particular moment, right, and COVID-19? Um, so here are my key points. 
when we study the impact of COVID-19, we have to recognize that this is a multi-level global crisis that involves the economy, uh, I mean, health, of course, but the economy, society, the global order, and geopolitics. Uh, so it's generating great stress in the global order. What's particularly potent about this crisis is its actual timing. Uh, if it had happened in 2015, probably the direction would be different. Um, so we're in the midst of a great US-China competition, uh, as well as a current US opposition to most global institutions. Um, we could call this a veto on global uh, multilateral institutions. Uh, and this, is, this has paralyzed the global response. Um, I guess we can say the crisis also illustrates the gap between the, the big uh, functional need for effective reforms of global institutions to enable global cooperation and the actual fragmentation of political leadership today. Uh, so then I'm going to focus on a number of takeaways. Actually, I now have 10 takeaways. Uh, so the data is clear. This is uh, as of a few hours ago, we are at 48 million cases worldwide, over 1 million deaths, but lots of recoveries, 20 to 34 million. We also see from the graph that the cases keep going up. So we're not out of the woods yet at the global level. We are looking at, uh, you know, between 400 and 600,000 cases per day, new cases. Um, in terms of major countries, um, you know, we see the U.S. being a bit of a surprise with over 20% of global cases. India, Brazil uh, follow, but of course, this is uh, relative to population. And then the rest here show the list of key countries, but um, they don't aggregate by region. So there is an effect here, a population effect on this graph. Um, this is the death count. Uh, so we see the U.S. Uh, passing 230,000, going to what 240,000 people uh, killed. Uh, we see uh, Brazil, uh, very important. And then um, we see uh, India going up, uh, I think it's this one, uh, past 100,000. This is an interesting graph from the Financial Times that shows how the COVID uh, shock in terms of death uh, toll has, has moved, right? Initially, it was an early moment with China, and then uh, Europe became the center of this crisis. Then it moved to the U.S., and then, uh, you know, Latin America followed, and now it's a very, very important part of the crisis. And then India came up. Africa remains very low, and the rest of Asia remains low. Uh, so we have, you know, a shifting shock to a large extent. Um, so the first takeaway, or the first point, is that COVID-19 is not responsible for a number of things that are, that in a way, that are trends that were happening before COVID-19. So we are in the midst of a historic shift in the balance of power. Uh, and this is not just China. 21% of the global GDP in nominal dollar and about 20% in the PPP dollar have shifted hands between 2000 and 2018 from uh, the OECD, the advanced uh, economies, to emerging countries especially, but developing and emerging Asia in general. Uh, half of that shift went to China, the other half went to India, South Asia, Central Asia, Africa, and others. So that it predates COVID. We are in the midst of a big historic shift in balance of power with the rise of the non-West. Uh, second, we have seen fraying uh, you know, or decaying global institutions over recent years with tensions around them. Uh, third, we have seen a battle around globalization. Uh, globalization and global markets advancing beyond the capacity of global rules and also domestic rules. We have seen trade peaking, not quite going in reverse, but peaking. We have seen the stop of the increase in trade, and it goes back to the global financial crisis of 2008. Uh, in fact, we're still living through the legacies of the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Uh, we have a more precarious middle class in many countries, especially the U.S., and then we're living through big systemic change and shocks, the two biggest being climate change and the fourth industrial revolution, the digital revolution. All this predates COVID. Um, we have seen hardening regimes in China and Russia that also predates. Uh, we have seen the erosion of the liberal international order of 
the rules-based order under President Trump, uh, with a shifting position by the U.S. since 2017 on those issues. Uh, and then we have seen erosion of arms control regimes caused by Russia, Russia and the U.S. So those are, this is the world before COVID-19, uh, and then COVID-19 came. So now we can uh, study what, what happened with COVID-19. Um, so those are a few graphs showing, and those are from the IMF World Economic Outlook from October, just a few uh, weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, that shows, first of all, policy uncertainty, global economic policy uncertainty. This is the blue graph, has been going up since 2016, has been gradually going up. And in fact, under COVID-19 has gone down a little bit because there is less trade war uh, and less trade, U.S. trade policy uncertainty. It's been a little quieter over the last three months in particular. Uh, but this predates COVID-19. Uh, this is the geopolitical risk index used by the IMF. This is quite conservative. But you see that graph going up prior to COVID, right, with uh, various uh, crises at the worldwide level. Um, Protest worldwide. We have seen waves of protests in many, many countries. Uh, and this is almost in every region of the world. This, again, uh, predates COVID-19. And on the COVID-19 has had a big decrease. And then it's, re it's coming back now since the summer. Um, oh, uh, yes. Um, and then in the U.S., uh, we have had big set of protests around, uh, you know, the racial question after the death of George Floyd. Uh, and this is post COVID-19, but this is independent from COVID-19. So this unsolved major legacy of racial tensions in the US uh, remains, you know, as a reality. Uh, my second point is that uh, COVID-19 has hit our global system because we were vulnerable at the level of global pandemic governance. Uh, this is a crisis that was pre-announced. In fact, several key books on pandemic governance told us that we were going to have a crisis just like this. So it's, a, it's not a surprising crisis. We have weak institutional capacity uh, to pandemics. At the, uh, the World Health Organization uh, is important. It's the only global organization on health, but lacks a rapid reaction force. Uh, it functions more a bit like a peer review uh, system where you won't announce a pandemic until all the scientists and all the data comes in uh, with a very, very high reliability. But it would be more useful to have the call for a global pandemic much earlier in the, in the curve. So it was announced March 11 in this case, which is way too late. Uh, and of course, it relies on governments for access. And so the access in China was always a problem. Uh, and we know early January that China initially refused access to the WHO team. Uh, it's all, WHO also suffers from U.S. withdrawal uh, and then now competition over vaccines, what we call vaccine nationalism. Um, there is a big alliance. We're going to talk about it, COVAX, but the U.S. and Russia have not joined. Um, the funding of WHO is actually problematic because it's small. And it's heavily uh, voluntary. There is very little mandatory funding. This is data from the Financial Times. Um, and, um, and so the WHO funding relies heavily on foundations um, and all kind of private sector, uh, private sector uh, sources um, and voluntary uh, donations by states, but all the voluntary funding and institutional funding and private sector funding usually is targeted. They want to give money on one particular disease or one particular campaign. Uh, and so it's very hard to fund uh, permanent staff or permanent resources. Um, second uh, sub point on the health side is that we have known for years, you know, for we could say decades, and there's this great book by Oster Holman Oshaker from 2017, showing that essentially we face two types of global pandemic threats, both of which are zoonotics, that is, they come from animals. Uh, the first one are flu risks, and in fact, scientists always thought that the, a global flu is the biggest risk for the world, similar to the Spanish flu, the so-called Spanish flu, which was not Spanish uh, in 1918, 1919, 1920, which killed at least 50 million people at the end of World War I, including many in India. In fact, there is a relation with that, uh, between that flu and the history of India. 
because apparently uh, Mahatma Gandhi was so angry at how poorly the British had managed the Spanish flu in India with so many deaths that this uh, shifted his position and, and he decided to, uh, you know, to launch much more uh, dramatic actions to, uh, you know, to uh, protest the British Empire and then that moved to what, uh, uh, you know, a, sh a shift in his attitude. Um, so flus are pretty simple. They come from a chain of animals. To have a big global flu like Spanish flu, H1N1 in 2009, uh, it goes from chicken to pigs to humans. And so the major danger is to have industrial farming of chickens and of chick and of pigs in the same place. All flus come from chicken, from pigs, and initially from chickens. And one of the key solutions would be separating industrial farming of pigs and chickens. We have to note that the initial big uh, Spanish flu of 1919 and the H1N1 actually came from the U.S. Right, uh, from industrial farming there. Um, but they are high risk in uh, other places, including China, where there is industrial farming as well of pigs and chickens. Um, and then the second big uh, big danger is uh, coronaviruses. Uh, and those all come essentially almost all from uh, bats. And, but they don't come directly from bats to humans. Uh, they are transmitted by one animal typically. So either pangolin or for mercy was camel in the, in the Arabian Peninsula can be from snakes. And so the, the key is to monitor the reservoir of bats in tropical areas. That, and, and those reservoirs are you know, in Mexico, huge, huge uh, caves in the Yucatan Peninsula, in Africa, uh, in China, in South Asia. Uh, and we have actually very little knowledge of, uh, of that reservoir of, of coronaviruses uh, within bats uh, worldwide. But we know that where humans come more and more in contact, where there is loss of biodiversity, we have more contacts between flus and intermediary animals, I mean bats and the intermediary animals and humans. Um, so this is essentially what's happening. Uh, another point on the health side is that the pandemic outcomes so far, they're still moving, are very different. Uh, we don't have uniform uh, you know, sort of bad outcomes. Uh, and here I have done a classification of high death rate, so death per million, uh, mi medium death, death rate, and low death rates. Uh, and those numbers have been relatively stable for a couple of months, uh, actually. So you're likely to, to still be with those three columns over, uh, over the coming months. Um, so on the left side, what we find is some Latin American countries uh, led by Peru, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Argentina as well, and European countries, you know, Spain, um, UK, Italy, Sweden, France, and, uh, and it's others, right? Uh, and then the US, uh, US very high among the, the top 10 with 700 uh, deaths per million. Uh, and um, on, um, we also have one case in, uh, in Africa, South Africa. South Africa is half of all cases in Africa, but most of Africa otherwise is not as affected. Um, we also find for Canada, we find uh, the province of Quebec, which is very affected. Uh, then we have the medium death rate countries. And here we have a few Europeans doing okay, you know, Switzerland, Hungary, Austria, Germany. Uh, and then we find Israel, Canada, Russia, uh, and then India on the lower side here at 90 deaths per million. Um, uh, on the South Asia side, we have Philippines and Indonesia. We have Egypt. Uh, and then we have my own province of British Columbia at 52. Um, and then on the low side, uh, under 50. I mean, of course, for some of them, uh, you will know better than me uh, for South Asia, but Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan are in that box. Uh, I, from what I read, uh, the numbers may be underestimated there. Uh, we have also Australia, and then we have actually many African countries. Uh, and I picked two here, Senegal and Ethiopia, one in West Africa, one East Africa. Uh, and then we have East Asia, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, the Pacific, New Zealand, and then China, Thailand, Vietnam, Taiwan. Vietnam and Taiwan are leading uh, in terms of the lowest numbers, and Thailand, very, very low. We also have Cuba, um, interestingly. And then uh, Nigeria is also here. But again, the numbers may be underestimated. So we have very, very 
different uh, outcomes. Uh, the cases is something else, but the cases are dependent on the number of tests. So here I pick uh, uh, the number of deaths per million as a more stable uh, metric. Um, in terms of US, uh, there's a variation among states, uh, but if you take the biggest states, no New, New Jersey, New, uh, New York, the numbers are even much higher. Um, uh, and so while most of the world is back in lockdown now, or par or partial lockdown, you find meanwhile China reopening, uh, and they had a giant pool party in Wuhan, the, the, the ground zero of the pandemic, and there's zero cases now in Wuhan. Uh, Next point on the pandemic side is there is a puzzling mismatch between pandemic institutional capacity as measured in 2019 by the Global Health Security Index and the actual outcomes. So this is the graph uh, that came from the Glo Global Health Security Index, which was a joint venture between the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, and other partners. Uh, and you could see uh, they measured, uh, you know, the readiness for a global pandemic. The U.S. was the best prepared. U.K. was second best. And then you find uh, the ranking of other countries. You find India in the middle here, along with China. Um, and then you find actually Thailand was pretty, uh, pretty strong. Um, and so that's roughly what was prepared just before the pandemic. Uh, and then I've done a two by two tables. Uh, between the death rate and the GHS index. And so you find, uh, you know, some, in a way, some um, expected outcomes, right? Some places where the index was low to medium um, and where uh, the death rate is medium to high. So where you expected hardship and you find here in Indonesia, India, Russia, Italy, um, you find countries with expected success, very, very high readiness, uh, Germany, Switzerland, uh, South Korea, Thailand, Japan, Taiwan, although now Germany and Switzerland are going toward the negative side. So they may, full, uh, they may soon fall down to the lower box here. Uh, and then you find countries better relative to their preparation index, uh, Vietnam, China, maybe Pakistan, if the numbers uh, hold. Uh, many African countries, uh, Mongolia, Uruguay, and then the underperformers, uh, US, UK, France, Sweden, much of Canada, Brazil, um, those who really didn't perform as well as their readiness should have uh, led them to perform. Um, so that's actually quite surprising. Um, we're back, you know, in Europe, back in deep lockdown. And in fact, you see a very steep resurgence as bad as in April, May, uh, in places like Czech Republic, Netherlands, Belgium, Spain, France, Italy, UK. And we know France, for example, is back on the uh, police mandated curfew, where people cannot leave their home unless they download a pass and they have to have a reason, like going to healthcare or to do uh, uh, necessary shopping, but for other reasons, they cannot leave their home. Um, so this is the hospital resurgence in countries like Belgium, France, Italy, uh, Spain, UK. We find that we have crowding in hospitals again at the moment. Um, the WHO and World Economic Forum uh, on, in September actually singled a few countries, seven countries, as doing better than their readiness uh, should have uh, led them or who basically had grassroots healthcare measures and have done pretty well. Uh, and so they were cited as being Thailand, Italy, Mongolia, Mauritius, Uruguay, Pakistan, and Vietnam. Um, so the clues in terms of good performance, uh, of course, the institutional health capacity, having medical capacity, testing capacity, a central command, good legal capacity helps. We find that this is what happened for Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, for example. They were very ready because of SARS and MERS, and they had passed all the laws and had accumulated uh, reserves of masks and those kind of things. Uh, second is high reactivity. So the ability to call an emergency very fast and to have a central command and uh, break standard operating procedures, the best for this may have been Taiwan. Uh, they did this on January 14, which is very, very early. Uh, Korea did this at the end of January. Uh, Vietnam was end of January. Uh, but the WHO did it uh, March 11, right? So the call for a global pandemic. 
Uh, and Europe and US uh, did it only in March. Uh, there were some actions in January, but very slow in February. Uh, so that it's very interesting to see how fast uh, you know, countries uh, decide to shift, uh, you know, to shift their procedures. Uh, third uh, is the ability to have non-politicized government that relies on science and data and the ability to coordinate all levels quite fast. Uh, Forced trust in government uh, helps. And then finally, uh, effective and powering communication, particularly in democracies, this is what's most effective, uh, relying on the autonomy of people rather than orders, tending to values, emotions, and stories, pulling in citizens and civil society, pulling in all the grassroots medical uh, system. Uh, on this, I have read that India did well uh, with very good communication with grassroots. Um, but you will know better. I look forward to learning more on the Indian situation from all of you in the audience. Um, that's in my province. Uh, everywhere you go now, there's that poster. And it's all around this new hero, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry, who is uh, the chief medical officer for our province. And she has done a daily press conference. Is very, very empathetic, cares about people, non-political uh, and keeps giving the good practices and everyone is watching her. She's become the folk hero. But it's interesting that she is the hero rather than, uh, you know, the premier of the province or the minister of health. Uh, this was a clever move by the government to delegate to her. And she's a doctor. She's an epidemiologist. Um, so um, my third point is shifting to the economy. Uh, and the economic shock has been enormous and unequal. Uh, it's generating strong losers and winners, uh, both at the domestic level and the global level. So it's become a huge natural experiment. Um, and it's actually painful in many groups. So domestically, uh, this generates huge inequality because people who work in services or work uh, in manufacturing have been hit much more than those who can work at home. Uh, so there's a big digital divide. And the informal sector, for example, in India, will, is hit much more. Um, we see that 30 to 40% of society in most countries is affected much more than the rest. Uh, we're in the midst of a massive digital transformation, but again, unequal. Uh, we see large increase in debt. And we see uh, you know, that the quality of spending, whether it's investing into a future green economy in particular, will have huge difference over time. Uh, so countries, based on what they did, will you know, do better or worse uh, going forward. At the global level, uh, we find that countries who are speedy with the virus are able to recover faster and therefore gaining in terms of global economy. And the contrast actually between China and the U.S. and Europe is big. Uh, according to the IMF World Economic Outlook, China will still grow plus 2% in 2020, while the rest of the world is all negative. Uh, and we'll have 8% in 2021, which make China roughly going 10% in the two years. The US is only growing about 4%. Europe will be negative, Japan negative. So we see that uh, the net outcome was that, was that China will gain in terms of its size in the global economy and relative to the US and Europe and Japan. Um, the ratio will move from about 65% to the US GDP to 75% or so by 2021 as a net outcome of moving faster on the virus. Um, March 2020 will be remembered as a historic, enormous shock uh, in humanity. Uh, people in the IMF have said initially was one third of the global economy shut down, never done before in human history, all at the same time. The numbers now show a 20% drop in uh, Q2 uh, in the global economy. Uh, and it all happened very, very quickly. Uh, in second quarter, the U.S. was minus 35 percent. Unemployment shot up 11 million in the U.S. by summer 2020, even though it's uh, going back now the other way very fast as well. There is a bit of a V-shape in the U.S. Uh, this is from the uh, IMF, uh, the global driving and wa walking mobility indices. And you find that the walking median and driving uh, uh, globally went down, uh, you know, <laughs> pretty massively uh, by 60%, um, so pretty interesting, but came back by June uh, in terms of driving, but driving came back faster than walking, which is interesting. Um, we expect the reverse, but 
Uh, this is in terms of the economy, uh, a pretty interesting summary graph, which shows the impact, the loss of GDP. So uh, February, March, China was losing, uh, you know, five, seven percent of GDP. Uh, you know, a that's a global impact, right? So China was minus 30 percent, but it turned into a seven percent global GDP loss. Um, and then later, we see the North American shock, we see Western Europe, and then we see Asia as a whole, including India, uh, and then we find Latin America and the rest of the world. So by April, the whole global economy was minus 20 percent. And by September, who were about minus seven, eight uh, percent in terms of uh, uh, year on year comparison. So this is the size of the lockdown shock, the, the shock of the lockdowns. Uh, World Economic Outlook, it says that for 2020, the global economy will be minus four percent. That's for the whole year, uh, but will bounce back in 2021 with plus five. The advanced economies uh, hit. Uh, more than the emerging markets and developing economies. Uh, so the numbers are better somewhat for the emerging markets, but still a minus for the whole developing emerging world is, uh, is new. We didn't have this in, 20, in 2008, 2009. Uh, Region-wise, we find uh, Latin America hit the worst, minus 8%, Middle East minus four, the euro area, uh, actually Latin America and euro are the two worst. Uh, euro area minus eight, uh, with some bumps back coming. But you will see that on the two years added, Europe will not be back by the end of 2021 to where it was before the shock. Uh, Latin America either. The U.S. will maybe not be back, but uh, maybe, uh, yeah, apparently it won't be back yet. Uh, emerging and developing Asia will be back. Uh, and uh, has a smaller a drop and a bigger bounce back predicted. Um, those are the numbers per country. So here uh, we can focus on two very interesting ones, China and India. So China is still predicted as a plus 1.9 for the year and plus 8 next year. India minus 10, but plus 9. So India will roughly equalize, right, over the two years. So it's awesome. Two years, but uh, Iran will be on the plus territory, um, and Russia will still be on the negative side here. Brazil negative side, Mexico negative side. If you add the two, um, it's a rough. Uh, so, in terms of middle class growth, I was chatting with Homie Karras at Brookings, uh, and probably he said uh, this will reduce the speed of middle class expansion worldwide by about one year. Uh, all the growth uh, at the moment will be in Asia broadly, but we don't know yet how bad the impact and how early the bounce back will be in the case of South Asia. We do know for East Asia that they are bouncing back already. Uh, and so the global middle class currently is mostly growing in Asia. Uh, that's the center of growth for the world, in including uh, South Asia. Um, fiscal responses were very different. You can see India on the left here. Uh, so you find the U.S. Uh, and Germany, in particular, and Japan doing the biggest by far. So there's high inequality uh, in what countries have been able to do, and it's based on the rooms that they have. The U.S. has very large room because everybody is buying uh, U.S. bonds uh, because the dollar is the currency reserve. Germany has very high reserve because it's very, uh, you know, has very, very good and strong fiscal position. Uh, and that created inequality initially. Germany was better able to respond than Southern Europe. Uh, and Japan, you know, has zero interest rates and the central bank is, a central bank is buying a high proportion of the bonds, so also has very large space. Uh, to, you know, this is interesting to note that most of the space for, uh, you know, the Eurozone, the US, or Japan comes from the central bank stepping in. And so there's a massive amount of debt uh, being bought by the central banks in those three countries. Massive QE, basically, uh, continuing. Um, in terms of debt shock, this is the estimation by IMF. Uh, if you do over the two years relative to 2019, uh, all you need to know is the top uh, layer here. For advanced economy, um, their uh, debt as a whole will be increasing by 25% uh, of GDP. 
US 30%, Canada 20%, Japan 30%, and so far India is estimated 13%. Uh, so this is a big jump in debt uh, relative to global GDP. Uh, we can say that humanity is really at a crossroad. We have a global economic system that's like a bicycle. We are not organized for having a drop like this. Uh, and when there is a drop of that magnitude and that speed, uh, it can break many linkages. And what we don't know yet is how much will be broken by this crisis. Will it be a, a clean V-shaped rebound or will there be a lot of human suffering and human losses and institutional loss coming out of this crisis? We will know next year. And again, a lot depends on the U.S. behavior, uh, which in turn depends on the election, which uh, we don't know the outcome about yet. Um, fourth point, globalization is under tension. Uh, there's been a lot of signs of tensions accelerated by COVID, but we also have resilience. So on the tension sign, we find, of course, that trade flows are taking a hit this year. Uh, there is a lot of countries trying to reshore supply chains of medical good or digital uh, product or you know, electronic products, including the US, Japan, Europe, um, including India as, as well because of tension with India and China. Um, we find efforts to decouple from China uh, especially in the U.S., part of Europe, part of Asia, we find fragmentation of the internet and of data. Uh, but on the other side of the ledger, we still find support for trade and global exchange uh, around the world outside U.S. and part of Europe. We find that the global digital economy is booming. We find that Japan, EU, Africa continue to support and advance trade agreements, uh, including uh, you know, in Africa with the African uh, continental free trade area. And then we find a process of recoupling in Asia between all sub-regions with increased uh, cross-regional trade uh, among all the sub-regions. And that's part of the you know, increasing trade within Asia. We also find increased uh, connections between Asia and Africa. So we could uh, see the beginning of a cross-Asia-Africa region, which uh, is about 75% of world growth right now. Um, Fifth point, very important, global governance is missing in action and has been paralyzed or has been really uh, dysfunctional in 2020. Uh, so among the failing or underperforming institutions, we can uh, list the G7. Uh, note that the G7 doesn't have a summit plan this year. There was a summit plan for July and it was canceled because European leaders refused to travel to the US because of the pandemic. Uh, then President Trump says he would have uh, an enlarged G7, and that would include actually India, uh, but uh, and Russia and and um, and other, but not China. Um, and uh, Europeans all said they are opposed to having Russia joined by the G7. In any case, so far there's no plan. We may have no G7 for the first time in uh, 30 plus years. The G20 is in great hardship. Uh, it's going to be a digital meeting in November in Saudi Arabia, but very difficult. Uh, NATO is very tense. Uh, the UN Security Council has been paralyzed over this crisis, initially by Chinese veto, then American. Uh, so American and China agreed on this, you know, refusing to, uh, uh, to let the UN Security Council proceed. Uh, the UN General Assembly, General Assembly in September was a fighting ground uh, with very, very different speeches and a very, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, difficult uh, conflicts actually among leaders, including US and China. Uh, the WTO is currently paralyzed. There is a consensus candidate for DG that emerged, but has been, you know, and it's the Nigerian former finance minister and former, uh, uh, you know, deputy of the World Bank, and former managing director of the World Bank, but uh, vetoed so far by the US. Um, we see some institutions, however, below the leadership level that have functioned somewhat and of, uh, uh, you know, still working hard to help uh, solve this crisis that include the IMF, the World Bank, regional development banks, and the WHO, uh, especially when it comes to support for the COVAX coalition. Uh, the causes for this underperforming was number one, US veto on many global institutions and, and the lack of interest or the opposition by President Trump. And number two, US-China tensions. Um, the lesson, however, is the U.S. is critical to the global system. 
uh, and more so than anyone uh, ever dreamt. Um, we also find significant uh, institutional capacity. So the problem is we have global markets, we have global risks, and we don't have well-functioning global governance. Um, and so that can create cascade effects or, or failures. It matters because we need to coordinate the vaccine generation and distribution. We need to support healthcare systems around the world. We need to give, uh, you know, find ways to support financially constrained countries that don't have space for countermeasures. We need to limit the damage to the informal and unprotected sectors. We need to create space for recovery and we need to avoid breaking down the global trade system or the institutions. Uh, so we really need global governance. Um, Prime Minister uh, Modi noted uh, at the UN General Assembly in September 26, uh, it was digital, of course, but he said the whole world is fighting the global pandemic of Corona for the last eight, nine months. Where is the United Nations in this joint fight against the pandemic? Where is its effective response? So he did put uh, his finger on, the, on one problem here. Uh, and he did finish with hope that uh, the UN is critical for the welfare of the world and we have to... Uh, find ways to, uh, to buttress it. Um, this is the G20 uh, digital. It's a real lemon for Saudi Arabia, right? What a year to uh, chair the G20, not easy. Um, and so we'll see what happens. I mean, there is good technocratic preparation at the lower level, uh, but uh, you know, to get any breakthrough will be difficult. Um, that's the positive, however, the COVAX facility, which is a global portfolio approach aiming at fair, efficient vaccine, or what we could call vaccine multilateralism, uh, is the fund joined by Gavi, which is uh, this organization funding vaccine for low-income countries, along with the WHO and CEPI, uh, joined by 184 countries, including India, China, Japan, and the EU, but not Russia and the US. The goal is to secure 2 billion vaccine doses from 14 different sources to have a good portfolio, uh, 1 billion of which will go to 92 low and middle income countries at no cost, and 1 billion for the wealthier countries who pay for the vaccine. Uh, and so the, the idea is to have a minimum initially 10% and 20% uh, access for all the countries to cover uh, the most vulnerable in the, in the healthcare system. Uh, the Serum Institute of India is a critical player, the biggest vaccine producer in the world, uh, and has with a license to uh, Oxford uh, to produce one doses for COVAX, half of which would go to India. Uh, COVAX has other uh, contracts with Spain and uh, Korea. Uh, so that's the most positive effort uh, going on in, in the global multilateralism uh, of COVID. Um, there is 30 types in clinical trials and 160 types being tested for vaccine now, uh, but there is intense vaccine nationalism and different priorities. Leading countries are US, UK, Germany, China, South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, and Russia, uh, as you can see here. Uh, in terms of production, this is the evaluation of production. This is moving fast. Uh, we'll see if the U.S. can build all this capacity because it wasn't uh, all in place. You know, there's a, a dash to produce. But historically, India has had the biggest uh, vaccine production capacity. Um, and we find uh, Norway coming up fast as well uh, and Europe otherwise. Uh, so it's highly centralized. Uh, Prime Minister Modi said something very powerful uh, September 26. Um, and uh, essentially giving an insurance to the global community that India's vaccine production and delivery capacity will be used to help all humanity in fighting the crisis um, and uh, moving toward fast delivery. Uh, sixth, point number six, democracies and actually all countries, but particularly democracies have been under duress in this COVID because COVID is a bit of a pressure cooker for frustrations and tensions within societies. We find high health inequality and high economic inequality as a result of COVID, which creates tensions. Uh, social media as well unleashes emotions and echo chambers. We call this infodemics. And democracies are more vulnerable to infodemics and social media rumors and wrong, uh, and wrong facts. Uh, there's also vulnerability to strong men during such crisis. 
Uh, this is a period of uncertainty, the dangers of demagogy, demagogy using the anxieties of people uh, for, for, de for recipes that are not, uh, that are not positive. Uh, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt wrote this book, uh, When Democracies Die, saying that the critical elements for survival of democracy is mutual accommodation and institutional forbearance. We find those things under tension in key democracies like the US now. Uh, so COVID will be seen later as a litmus test for the resilience of democracy. Uh, and it's essential for democracy to find ways to protect the institutions while dealing with COVID-19 at the same time. Um, point seven, uh, COVID generates disorder risks and uncertainty. I call this the fog, not like the fog of war. We have the fog of a COVID crisis. Uh, and one reason is we, it creates so much uncertainty and tension while diplomacy is disabled. And a big finding of this period is that Zoom diplomacy doesn't work very well. Zoom is good for academia, uh, even though I wish I could uh, interact in the flesh with all of you in person, right, in a room and learn from each other. But for diplomacy, it's a problem because much diplomacy happens in the corridors, chit-chatting, eating and drinking together. We're human beings, right? We share more when we eat together at the same table. Um, and US-China diplomacy is frozen. Uh, it's, a, it's the first year in, in long uh, times, you know, uh, that there is no communication at the top leadership uh, between US and China. Uh, social media makes things worse by increasing misperceptions. We find in this period, under this period of uncertainty, that uh, China is more on hitch and has taken more harsh measures in international affairs. Uh, and we find that China seems to be driven by a bottom line mentality uh, or nothing to lose thinking since they're under attack from the US, there is nothing to lose. And so China has taken more risk and harsher methods, including with their wolf warrior diplomacy in much of the world, in Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and this extremely puzzling border war with India, uh, which from a strategic perspective doesn't seem to be good for China in any way. The costs have been enormous. Uh, and so I'm convinced this has been more driven by domestic politics in China and tensions within China rather than a strategic plan. Um, US is also unhinged uh, with uh, you know, strange uh, isolation around COVID management a very nationalistic approach uh, and uh, the strong push for decoupling and an ideological conflict, which doesn't help uh, global cooperation. Um, and then we find also adventurism by Turkey uh, in the case of Azerbaijan, and Armenia and others. So as usual, when there's crisis and tension, there is space for uh, opportunistic players to uh, take advantage. Um, we also find, in general, a historic clash of narratives during uncertainty, uh, you know, because societies and leaders required focal points, and domestic narratives provide those focal points based on culture and history. Uh, you know, and however, those narratives can create misunderstanding by other countries, and they create misperceptions. They can create a sense of threat and trigger a fight or flight behavior. Uh, there's a lot of interesting research in economics, including the book by Ekeloff and Schiller on the formation and impact of narratives, uh, which is, I think, a very, very important uh, area of research right now. Uh, point eight, regionalism is picking a bit of the slack where global governance is failing. Uh, in the EU, you find that the EU has been able to, do, uh, to turn a lemon into a lemonade. Uh, with the European Commission bonds, Eurowide. They're not technically Euro bonds, they're European Commission bonds that include the non-Euro countries. Uh, they're going to borrow and then do 310 uh, billion euros of grant, direct grant. So this is a breakthrough that didn't happen during the Euro crisis in 2010-14. Africa is holding up better than the rest of, uh, you know, of the world to some extent. We find strong resilience in Asia, in Asian regionalism. Uh, the Japan-China relation remains functional. There is tension on the security side, but there is a continuation of the economic relationship and diplomatic relationship between Japan and China. Um, and interestingly, the Japan-led ADB uh, and the China-led AIB end up cooperating uh, and doing similar things, moving all their resources 
toward uh, helping countries get space to fight COVID-19. And that's very interesting. In fact, both AIB and ADB have also uh, uh, given resources or, or landing to India. Uh, and that's, you know, that was not predicted, right? That there will be convergence between a China-led regional bank and a Japanese-led re regional bank. Um, point nine, we also find innovative minilateralism led by middle powers. Um, we find good ideas and initiatives, joint declarations. We find lots of fluidity in communication. We find the Alliance for Multilateralism with 48 countries. Uh, that so far doesn't include India, but include 48 countries, the sole middle powers. Uh, on the trade side, there is the MPIA, which is a WTO dispute settlement workaround led by EU and Canada, uh, excluding, however, US, India, Japan, UK, and Korea. Korea signed in the initial, but then was not a signatory of the final agreement. Uh, China is part of it, however. Uh, we find a burst of activity on trade and, and security coming out of Japan, which is very multilateralist. Uh, problem number one, U.S. remains central to global governance. And so minilateralism without the U.S. Uh, lack, uh, you know, uh, critical mass. Number two, uh, China and the China-U.S. spiral uh, can, uh, you know, generate so much negative momentum that it can overwhelm this minilateralism that is coming from the non-China, uh, non-US uh, world. Uh, sometimes we use a bit of China, but non-US. Um, and so the question here is, can middle powers, and basically the G18, uh, save the rules-based order uh, in case of a Trump re-election? Can they get critical mass effect? Um, uh, an interesting example that was yesterday, uh, this is the Ministerial Coordination Group on COVID-19 which just welcome India. It includes Brazil, France, Germany, India, Italy, Singapore, and UK, and Canada, led by Canada. Uh, and so here uh, was interesting. It's a very flexible discussion group uh, that tried to share resources and, and best practices on COVID. Uh, the Alliance for Multilateralism at the summit on the margin of the UN General Assembly, uh, September 25. Very interesting declaration coming out of it with uh, lots of good principles. As far as I know, I didn't see India joining this, um, but they focus on climate, health, digital technology, and gender equality, uh, trying to build back a better world after the crisis, um, rather than just rebuild the same. Uh, I lost my points. I Okay, I'm back here. I hope you can still see my PowerPoint. Um, yes. We so can. what is? Yeah. Okay. And as um, I'm nearing the conclusion now, what is needed uh, to improve the system is real big time thinking here, because this is a huge moment. Uh, you know, of course, to avoid a collapse, but also avoid civiliz civilizational collapse. We need to engineer a more resilient, thinner, more diverse. Uh, and um, you know, globalization without collapse of trade, but with a better quality, better fairness. Um, and this is a time where we need other voices beyond the US and China uh, to break free from this tightening jaw of US-China confrontation. Um, and therefore, my final point is that post-institutional, uh, in this post-institutional world, leaders become essential. Uh, global institutions, norm and standard operating procedures are all eroding and being damaged, um, except regional institutions. So leadership is critical to stem the unraveling of the rules-based international order. Uh, and of course, bad or weak leaders can make things worse. We know from historians that when you have great uncertainty, great crisis, if on top of it you have bad leaders, you end up with the 1930s and a tit for tat unraveling of a system. Um, remember also that COVID-19 may be just a, re a dress a rehearsal for the fight with climate change, which is a much bigger crisis, uh, which will dominate everything from the 2030s. Um, in conclusion, COVID-19 is a game changer because of its timing at a time of perfect storm and global cooperation in crisis. It's having a great differential effect domestically and globally. 
It's a health, social, and economic crisis in one, uh, but it's also pressure cooker for security and geopolitical tensions. It enables opportunistic and dangerous moves. There is urgency for powerful, innovative leadership to avoid the tragedy of history and rebuild a common global institutional order. What we must avoid is tit for tat downward spirals uh, that would create a world that's bad for everybody. So thank you for listening. Um, and I really welcome the discussion and look forward to it uh, now. Thank you, Professor Tevagian. So much packed in your uh, presentation. I think all of us would love to uh, maybe digest it over a period of time and uh, chew it gradually and slowly and internalize so much of uh, information packed in your uh, presentation, making lots of very interesting and some of uh, rather startling uh, projections. Uh, countries like Thailand, Mongolia are doing much better. Uh, how uh, democracies are disrupted, uh, but regionalism is uh, being strengthened again. Uh, I noticed that in the end, your last slide talked about post-institutional world, uh, whereas the banner that I have advertised uh, shows your last book, which is about leadership in global institution building. <laughs> but nevertheless, so you still underline that leadership would still be required, even to constitute uh, or construct that post-institutional world. If I get opportunity, I will be curious to, you know, maybe ask you something on that. But we already have one hand up, I can see. And let me just repeat for uh, some of our participants who may have joined us uh, either late or for first time. Uh, we usually prefer that you, in case you wish to make an intervention or ask a question, uh, you will have to switch on your video and raise electronic hand the way Kush Gayasan has already raised, you can see on screen, his blue electronic hand is up. But if uh, you are not able to do that, then I also say we can just, you know, keep waving this physical hand. Maybe I will miss it because these boxes keep shuffling. So you can also use physical hand to draw my attention and I'll be happy to also then give you the floor. Uh, we will have... Uh, each question answered individually by Professor Tibagian. So in that sense, we are lucky to have him early in the morning. It's just a little past 5 a.m. for him. So Canada is still to wake up and uh, draw his attention to what has happened in elections. Uh, let me with that go to my first uh, uh, person who asked uh, to make a comment is Dr. Kush Gayasen. Please unmute yourself and make your intervention. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor. It was a very good presentation. You have covered a whole range of areas and uh, it was really informative. So my question is basically take, uh, should take us to India-China relations. So what we see in this during a COVID-19 pandemic, that uh, it has really uh, brought up a very negative sentiment, which was already there in India, I mean, for China. But if we talk to any Indian citizen, even in the rural areas, I mean, they simply say that it's China which has, you know, uh, inflicted this entire COVID-19. And uh, therefore, uh, this negative sentiment we already see in country. And overall, now we see the relationship, how it has been so troubled during the last uh, six months particularly. So what we see the current scenario, that relations have been impacted during this pandemic. So this is number one, that how do we see in terms of takeaways or implications of COVID-19 for this India-China relations? And uh, secondly, how do you see that uh, in the China's One Belt, One Road initiative, which the countries are already were lining up, more than 60 plus countries, but now there is one need of economic uh, uh, partnership, relationship with China. And on the other hand, we see that the China is sort of pro being projected as a, a villain, perhaps, so to say that. So how do you see these two things, uh, your comment, please? Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Yeah, Dr. Kushkayas, and this is a, a very good question. Uh, I mean, two questions, very, very, uh, you know, gets to the heart. Uh, so um, there is no question that the India-China relationship is in very difficult straits. Uh, I, you know, obviously, it's the biggest trigger is this uh, border conflict, which led to the unfortunate death of 
Indian soldiers and we know also Chinese soldiers. Um, and then of course, then it colors everything else, right? Uh, so there is no question that this border conflict is, is really unfortunate. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a mistake. Um, you know, we, there's still a lot of uncertainty about exactly what happened, but no matter what, we know that, uh, you know, there was movement uh, forward by some uh, soldiers on the Chinese side, and that, uh, you know, eventually led to higher tensions. Uh, and so to me, this, you know, when I try to think in terms of strategic, uh, strategic analysis, it, it cannot make sense, right? Because when you hear some uh, Chinese scholars, they're aware that uh, a functional relationship with India is critical. And in fact, they're part of BRICS. There is a lot of common issues between uh, China and India around global economic governance. Um, and, and then, you know, the digital presence of China and India was very large. And all this is in jeopardy right now, right? Of course, public opinion in India is furious. Um, and so this, this is, you know, we, what, all we can say is it's very strange that that uh, a country with the tradition of great diplomacy uh, like China would let this happen. Um, I, so I, I believe that this is a, a period of competition within the Chinese system uh, for resources and for uh, attention that may have let this happen. I, I do also believe that there is strong strategic imperative, however, to contain this. So I, I think this border conflict will be contained, will not go further. Um, and, um, and, and however, you know, just like after 1960, 62, right, the, the public opinion in, in India to China was negative for years and years and decades was only improving later, right, much later. So the costs, yeah, in public opinion will be long lasting. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, yes, there is a blame and a worldwide now cleaning in India on COVID. Uh, and it, it's true. It originated in, in China. However, uh, for that, most uh, you know, pandemic experts globally tend to want to de-emphasize de the origin of any pandemic because, as I noticed earlier, flus and coronaviruses occur re repeatedly. You know, H1N1 uh, killed a million people and came from the U.S., right? Do we blame the U.S. for that? Uh, you know, and on and on, right? MERS came uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia and Jordan. Uh, so... I mean, the blame game on origin of pandemic will be endless, right? And there will be more. And we know that the coronaviruses will come wherever there are bats and there are bats in all around tropical areas. And we also know that flus will come wherever there are chickens. Uh, and so it's not a very... Uh, however, what we can blame is the fact that until January 20, so from December 31 to January 20, China did not let WHO uh, experts come in, and there was delay uh, on transparency in China. Although January 10, they shared the DNA sequence of the virus, which was a plus, right? Uh, not like for SARS-1. Uh, that after January 20, China then controlled the pandemic very harshly and effectively. Um, so, um, in terms, the relation is going to remain tense. There is no no question. Although I, I believe that we are now in stabilization period of the crisis. Um, and then in terms of Belt and Road, this is, uh, this is uh, an, that will slow it uh, because many projects have been slowed or put on hold for now because of uh, the freezing of communication and travel, uh, but it won't stop it. Uh, however, Belt and Road over the last two years was already slowing, right? Because many projects, essentially, the way I see the Belt and Road initiative was uh, it did uh, meet a need, right? There's many, many developing countries, especially Central Asia and Africa, where there was not even enough funding for infrastructure. So many countries did line up. However, uh, it's been done in a very decentralized way, sort of free for all, where every uh, company and every bank is going like, you know, very fast. And uh, the net outcome is there's a whole spectrum of projects. Some good, some middle, and some very bad. Many projects don't make sense financially, and of course have had negative environmental or community impact. And uh, with this crisis, uh, you know, that will accelerate the slowdown uh, and the need to, uh, you know, even for China's own sake, uh, to, to increase the quality. This was announced uh, at the Belt and Road Summit last year. Uh, and uh, we'll see where it goes, but there is heavy slowdown and, and the need for partners essentially. Um, 
that's how I would put it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I see uh, Henry Tillman has asked for the, the floor. Uh, and also I have been asked by Anirvan Mukherjee and also Pradeep Kumar Panda, but I don't see them on my screen. I see Pooja and Berkha on my screen with hands up. I'll come to them. So if those who are making requests either in text uh, or on my WhatsApp, you have to be on my screen for me to invite you. Let me now invite Henry Tillman to make his intervention, please. Thank you, Professor Singh, and good morning to Vancouver. I have uh, three children whose grandfather was the chairman of the University of Alberta oh. and was, was in Brian Mulroney's cab uh, cabinet for years and ran for PM in 1993. So I love Canada and uh, it's a great country. And so it's nice to talk to a Canadian. So first of all, and, and second, secondly, a brilliant pres uh, pre uh, presentation. I couldn't, I, I present all over the world, but I couldn't do an hour like that. So well done to you. and yeah, hold everyone's interests, including mine. I'm a specialist in Belt and Road. I, 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 and and uh, as I mentioned to Professor Singh, I spent the last three months analyzing every single thing China has done at BRI and COVID. It's yet to be, it's yet to be published. It's very close. But maybe I could have a little bit more for all of everybody on, the, uh, on this here so they can see how this has been. So the first thing I was taken aback by was I didn't realize that China was still the recipient of all this material until the 23rd of February. By the end of June, they 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 were actually people they were um, sending loads of aids and or drugs and or whatever to almost 100 countries. So in a matter of four months, it reversed from a recipient to touching almost 100 countries. I find that pretty extraordinary. So what we've looked at, and we, it's not published yet, is several components. The first component is all the, the drugs itself, yes, and the development of drug development and, and, and vaccines and joint ventures, not just investments, but also joint ventures. And it's not related to India, it's related to the whole world. The second thing we looked at is, is medical equipment, and whether it's medical equipment, whether it's masks, whether it's doctors, whether it's whatever, Many of those were add-ons. In fact, China first started uh, developing this in 1963 in Algeria and in 1975 in a Afghanistan. So they've been working on the healthcare piece because in China's own words, wealth is health. That's how they think. Yes. So then I start looking at, at all of those. So we then track all of those and we have obviously URL links to all those things. Then we started looking at those COVID loans, which you mentioned, which, which are baskets. Yes, a basket is there are a series of COVID loans to India from IIB, but there's a series of those loans beginning in Q2, growing in Q3. Same with NDB loans, Q2, Q3. And then we start finding um, it evolves into vaccines. So they start looking at vaccines in Q2. They begin to develop that in Q3 by Q3. There are 14 countries involved, <laughs> involved in testing vaccines. And you saw this morning's Twitter, the ruler of Abu Dhabi is getting a jab from Sinopharm. And then you see in Q3, a billion dollar loan to 13 countries in LAC. So if you look at this on the map, and I've built it, so I know what it looks like, it is extraordinary. So while the rest of the world is fumbling around, and by the way, they helped in Montreal, so you were right, Montreal was the first part of Canada that required a little bit of help. Um, when the rest of the world was fumbling around with this, and as you say, in democracies, China has been full on because this is part of a 650 transaction study since the WHO announced the, the launch of the Digital Health Road. Now, part of that study was published in, in April of 19, of, of 1718, data outbound looking at drugs across the BRI looking at uh, diseases across the BRI. So that was up to date as of the night, as of Q1, Q2, 2019. So we needed some delta on this analysis after that, which we didn't come to the whole concept of COVID. So we tracked two quarters pre-COVID and three quarters post-COVID. And I have to say, when you look at this, I, I am gobsmacked. I'm not released it. It currently sits with the Chinese government. I'm not sure they want to release it, but 
the, the, the way they've looked at this in a corporate way of building, because I'm, I'm a, a banker by trade, I work in, that's, that's all. So that's all. So I just want to share how it looks from a VR point of view. Yes, sir. Eves, you wish to respond to what uh, Henry has just said? Yeah, so Dr. Tillman, thank you very much. I love to see the data. This is super valuable. This is, yeah, amazing. So basically the punchline is China very, very active in BRI countries and beyond, I guess, because there's officially 63, uh, but what is 138. 138. 138. Yeah. All those with MOU, right? Okay, so yeah. they have a, a short list and a long list. Eh? Those with MOUs, uh, I guess, with masks and, and masks and vaccines, right? So, uh, yeah, it'll be fascinating to see where it leads. Now, in terms of political impact, that remains to be seen, right? Because, uh, you know, in case of Europe, for example, where there was critical mass diplomacy or, you know, even Canada, we, you know, there was not enough PPE in Canada. So the critical lifeline came from China uh, at the time when the U.S. was going to blockade Canada. Right. So there was a, a horrible wake up call for Canada. Um, uh uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't translate into any positive feeling to China because, of course, it came with uh, hawkish diplomacy and, and hawkish actions by China. So, uh, you know, this is more part of global interdependence, but I don't know if it leads to any actual political advantage for China. In some countries, maybe, but in many, no. Right? Okay, I also have some people writing in text box, but of course I'll give priority to people I see on my screen. Uh, Ms. Pooja Bhatt, you could be the next. Please unmute and make your introduction. Thank you, Professor, and it was a great presentation. Actually, I've answered the question that I'm going to ask in parts, but I still want to take your further brains on the question. Do you think that uh, the global response to coronavirus would have been different if there was no uh, trade war going on between the US and China? Because then the resources and these uh, these countries would have come together and these countries are, are the only countries that have those kind of resources and the world could have then come together rather than taking, you know, either the US way or the China way. Uh, and I would want to connect this question uh, with respect to the middle class that you were speaking because Asia is a home to middle power countries. So you were saying that there were a lot of bilaterals happening in that sense. But we would also agree that most of these middle powers do not have those kind of resources to fight uh, the massive uh, level pandemic such as coronavirus we are talking here. So in that sense, even those bilaterals are formed, they would not be very effective and they will still have to take uh, help from either, you know, one of the great powers. So do you think this entire uh, scenario of the US-China rivalry has changed the entire game, how we will handle these large issues, cal calamities and diseases like this? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah but this is a, a great, great question. Uh, and I'm convinced that, yes, it would be profoundly different. That, that's why I said the timing was so critical. If we uh, compare to 2009, the global financial crisis, or 2015, uh, when there was the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. So I'm convinced if she was at one of those times, uh, first of all, the WHO would be functional. There would, have been, there would have been an urgent G20 meeting. They would have increased the resources and the speed uh, of action of WHO. Um, and there would be uh, much more coordination. Uh, there would be uh, probably management of the, of the global vaccine race. Uh, on the economic side, we know, for example, that there was a plan to immediately trigger an SDR uh, increase in, uh, to have much more resources for all the developing countries to, uh, uh, to, to fight, right? to have uh, more fiscal space. Uh, instead, there was just a six month freeze on debt uh, repayment uh, for the least uh, for the, the least developed countries. That was some help, but it was extremely minor. Uh, and it was pushed actually by the bureaucracy, by World Bank and IMF bureaucracy, not even by the top uh, leadership of countries. Um, we could do so much more, right? There could be a much more coordinated support for all the least developed countries, and there could be much more functional response around the health side. Um, and um, you know, and this is what would this is in a way what happened in 2009 after the global financial crisis. Um, and also, there probably would have been less defensiveness by China in January uh, in the first place, right? Including, it's, it's true that China 
uh, in a way, slow down the WHO response uh, by not letting them come in and by putting pressure on WHO not to announce the pandemic too quick. That probably was at least accelerated by uh, the, the, the feeling of being under threat or whatever, the, the, the uh, bilateral tension. Uh, although that doesn't explain everything. That's where it's impossible to fully explain, right? We have two variable. The other variable is the, you know, is the authoritarian system of China where they are slow at uh, divulging bad news. Uh, but I'm convinced that the defensiveness, because when you talk to Chinese scholars, I mean, now it's hard, we don't go anywhere, but you, there is clearly an impact on the Chinese consciousness and public opinion of that trade war. They, they literally feel under siege, right? And they feel, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, we're back. They tend to compare to a 1900 and the Boxer uh, Revolt and then the eight, eight, uh, army, uh, eight country army that came and uh, took over Beijing. Because in cycle of calendar, Chinese cycle, this is the same year. We're exactly uh, in the same calendar. So there is that, that, you know, every country reacts according to its own history. And it's such that they feel under siege, they feel attacked, they feel, and they have this increased defensiveness about it. Um, so the answer is yes, uh, we are hit at a low point here in terms of global coordination. Uh, and we, we, as humanity, could have done so much better. Thank you. Uh, I have seen physical hand requests now from three people, Professor Nirmal Jindal, and also from Komal Badhana and Professor Kim Monso, but I will go in sequence. So I'm asking next uh, Barkha Dube to please unmute and make your intervention. Good morning, sir. So am I audible? Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I had a question to ask, and that is that, as you know, that uh, the role of data governance has become uh, so strongly obvious after the uh, uh, COVID pandemic and data governance has actually reshaped our, uh, you know, global governance in many ways, actually. So uh, how do you think is data governance going to uh, influence the decision making processes, uh, you know, in multilateral institutions in various terms uh, uh, as the time unfolds after COVID? Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, Barka Dubi. This is a, a great question. This is uh, one of the big, big headaches in global governance, right? W which is actually also at the heart of the future of global trade governance. So there, make no mistake about it, the data governance today is the object of a huge fight and, and the fragmentation of global regime. Uh, and this is very profound, very hard to solve. And so I'm actually very concerned about it. Uh, there is, it started as a three-way fight. It's not even a two-way fight, right? But now there is more because uh, we could maybe say at least four-way because now India has its own role in this. Um, but there is totally different approach, right? The first mover approach that he rose out of the Silicon Valley, which with hindsight, I think, is, uh, so, you know, has some problems with it. But that was data is owned by the companies that are offering services and in exchange for free services. So that compromise came up very early in the birth of the Internet. You could have Facebook for free. You could have Google for free. But then uh, there was no restriction on Facebook, Google and others uh, being able to gather data. They gather more data than anyone is aware of. And then to own that data. Uh, so that came in play very early in the model. Uh, maybe for global consumers, it might have been better to pay a tiny fee, but uh, have individuals retain some control of their own data. Uh, and then now, so this approach, which is still the U.S. approach and a big uh, corporation, the GAFA approach, uh, this is fighting. There is a fight coming out of the EU with the GPDR rules, which has brought into play the, the uh, role of privacy, data privacy. Uh, and uh, control over how this data is used. And so there's a huge fight between U.S. and, and, uh, and uh, EU on this. And then on top of it comes the issue of taxation because so much trade becomes digital and there is uh, you know, complete avoidance of taxation from anywhere, right? Those companies, because they're global, they're able to uh, position themselves in a way that they don't pay taxes to anyone. So the EU wants to tax them. That becomes a trade war between the U.S. and EU. 
Uh, and then there is, of course, China. So China, at some way, in some ways, was very realist about it. And they say, well, you know, this data is owned in the U.S. I, you know, this becomes critical for the regime survival. They, they looked at it from a regime survival, but also hardcore realism. Uh, and so they blocked it. And so all data in China remains blocked within China. Uh, they have blocked the big company, uh, the big uh, digital company from the U.S. And instead, they have given space for their own giant digital companies to rose, uh, where the data actually is not very well protected in the sense of privacy. It's still company owned, so they kept the same company ownership, uh, but uh, the government is able to have more access to it or put restrictions on it uh, you know, beyond what the U.S. has. Uh, and then now there was this effort in 2019 G20 by Japan to have uh, you know, a data a free and open data agreement. Uh, in the end, 17 countries signed on it, actually including China, which is interesting. Uh, but it was blocked mostly by India, but not just India. Also, uh, I think South Africa and at least one more. Uh, and so India is coming into this and is saying, well, on one hand, we know we like freedom, etc., but we don't want to be also complete naive in this. Uh, we, we don't want the Chinese to control Indian data, but we also don't want the data to be completely owned and controlled by foreign companies. Why we are so big, why not have space for our own uh, data regime, right? Uh, as far as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but so this is going into, uh, you know, because data, as it said, is the new gold of the future in this fourth industrial revolution, uh, the stakes are super high, uh, extremely high stakes, very hard uh, to find solutions. Uh, and so this is a big, big rift in the global economy right now. Thank you. Uh, I'll request next uh, Dr. Ghazala Faridi, please intervene, make your intervention. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for such a detailed presentation, Professor. My name is Ghazala Faridi, and I can see Stephen Pinker's book behind you. So in that context, uh, would you say that this uh, pandemic has brought out humanity's demons instead of their angels, especially at the international level, especially with regard to issues like vaccine nationalism? Also, if Trump does come back, can you remotely, like, you know, envision a China-backed global governance structure and the power center shifting back to Asia? And what kind of structure would that be? Thank you. Well, uh, Geza Faridi, those are fantastic questions. Very, very thoughtful. Uh, so your first question, yes, we see uh, more, on, on balance, more demons than angels at the moment, even though there's still some angel, particularly COVAX, right? This is a sign of hope. Uh, also, uh, all those alliances, the minilateral, uh, uh, minilateral conferences I mentioned, and all the connections, right? I was talking to our, uh, uh, you know, a foreign minister once on this, and he mentioned that he has more contacts uh, with more world leaders than in normal times. I mean, it, there is a fluidity in communication. It's all digital, however, maybe you can't have you know, lunch or dinner with them, but there is a number of, of contacts that is extraordinary, including between Canada and India, for example, at the moment. That's why uh, you know, India has joined this working group. So that's on the angel side, but uh, the problem is the angels currently uh, don't have the critical mass relative to the demons. And the the... You know, from a theoretical perspective, what I think is interesting, it goes back to uh, psychology uh, and, you know, some great uh, leaders in psychology, uh, Kahneman and Tversky, uh, and, and then uh, people I mentioned like Schiller and, and Akerlof on the economic side. We discovered that in times of uncertainty, in times of crisis, um, you know, it's harder uh, for human nature tends to rely more on its intuitions and emotions than on the rationality. We know from the works in psychology, we have what they call system one, system two. We have always a struggle between the more emotional, more intuitive nature and the more rational, uh, you know, so also the empathetic nature. We, human nature is complex. We have all of this. Crisis, uncertainty, and now social media tend to accelerate the more emotional, more intuitive responses. Uh, and the future of humanity requires a bit of tilt back toward the other way, toward uh, our global empathy and global rationality. And uh, currently, it doesn't have the lead in this crisis, and particularly because of that U.S.-China situation. 
uh, and I, I hope so for for the global academic community we have to find ways to uh, you know for essentially to uh, diffuse somewhat the cycle of emotions misperceptions wrong understanding about the other side uh, I still have hope we, we there is research in you know in psychology and economics in many fields uh, that could help us even in humanities that can help us in that way there is humanity has the potential uh, and there is a huge reservoir in India in this regard of wisdom and philosophy and research. Uh, but the stakes are high and time is moving fast. Social media is a challenge because it's so young, right? It's so new to us and it interacts with our human psychology in ways that were unpredicted. And maybe in 20 years will be better, but uh, 20 years is a long time right now. Uh, in terms of uh, US and China, um, it's true that if Trump is reelected, we know that there is a high probability that he will pull out of WTO entirely. He may actually pull out of NATO. Uh, I mean, he has said those things. Whether he eventually does it, we don't know. Uh, he will not support G7, G20 activities. He will not support the UN. You know, the speeches at the UN denounced the globalist idea. He will push for America first nationalism. Uh, so, it, the effort by everyone else, uh, you know, this multilateral, this middle power coalition has been to try to save a degree of common system with the, you know, where, where the stakes are common, where we can fight climate change, we can fight global pandemic, uh, while the U.S. is going the other way. It's a challenge. And then there's the China question. Uh, the difficulty to bring in China is that because of the depth of the U.S.-China confrontation, Number one and number two, the very puzzlingly, uh, you know, sort of aggressive actions by China this year, uh, including rhetoric actions. So, of course, so, some of those actions are in tit for tat cycle with the U.S., but some come out of China on its own. Uh, it makes it harder, right? And so, if you're a middle power, if you're, you know, Canada, if you're, you know, many others, if you're uh, Japan, if you're uh, it's hard to say we're going to work with China, but not the U.S. because U.S. is opposed to it in this context, right? So the reflex is to first do a coalition that has neither U.S. and China, but then you have no critical mass, right? Uh, although tactically, you can see China has joined COVAX, China has joined uh, the WTO workaround mediation agreement. So, um, uh, you know, we'll have to see where the actions are. China is complex at this moment. If China does certain actions, is philosophically supporting the rules-based order, the international order, but in practice on several key fronts is not, right? Is It's doing actions against. Uh, and so we, the China question in this context is difficult. And, and I hope uh, that people in China will understand that, for example, the, the wolf warrior diplomacy doesn't work, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. I will request Pradipta Kumar Panda and Khurshid Hamad to please switch on their videos in case they wish to make an intervention. And before I go to uh, Professor Nirmal Jindal, may I first go to Dr. Kim Ong So from Myanmar to please uh, make your intervention now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I am very I'm impressed very by your thought-provoking point. Uh, Professor Saran is very correct. We will take time to digest your big points. Uh, uh, the World Economic Forum uh, predicted uh, in uh, predicted that uh, in year 2021, in PPP 10, the Asian economy will become larger than the rest of the world coming for the first time since the 19th century. This trend is uh, becoming more and more clear uh, amid COVID-19. Uh, the South Korea is set to leapfrog Brazil, Canada, and Russia, which ran 9, 10, and 11 last year, respectively, as though economy uh, fear to be hit harder by the coronavirus pandemic. My question is, that how will China and India uh, will work and grow together to avoid that party interference in Asia? Thank you, sir. 
Oh, can, can you just repeat the final part? There was a little cut. You asked how China and India can work together. Or... Yes. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the, uh, the 21st century is said to be the Asian century because right. of the economy and uh, demography. Uh, the, in Asian century, both China and India were play very important role. Right. But uh, unfortunately, China and India have big uh, tension and how China and India will work and grow together. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so Mingala Baki Mong Su, this is wonderful. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't have Myanmar in the data. For some reason, the data set I downloaded from John Hopkins University did not have the data from Myanmar. So I wish... Uh, this is a country I have a very soft spot for because uh, 1994, I had the luck to travel for a month, uh, 1995 in, in Myanmar, and then uh, had some, uh, you know, met some of the warmest people ever uh, and and had some of my, uh, you know, life resolutions written. I, I was very, very inspired uh, in uh, actually also in India, but I found this is a, a place uh, very rich in human uh, wisdom, philosophy, religion, etc. Very profound, and so I felt very, very inspired. Um, um, yeah, so Myanmar is also <laughs> right between China and India, uh, so I can see that the stakes are very high. Uh, so it is true that all the trends and some of the global books show that. Uh, you know, uh, there is the rise of Asia in general. That um, also, what's very, very interesting, and people like Parakana in Singapore, but other scholars, you know, in the whole region, uh, showing that currently, what's very interesting is the first time since 1800 or 1840, since Western colonization disrupted Asia, that uh, Asia is being reconnected in all the parts. Uh, so, you know, there is more connectivity between South Asia and China and South Asia and India in, in India, South Asia and, uh, and East Asia and Central Asia being reconnected as well with all the subparts and then more and more connectivity as well with Africa. So uh, and that is indeed the center of the global economy right now. Uh, and while if you read too many U.S. newspapers, you keep reading about decoupling, cross-Pacific decoupling. Well, if you go to anywhere in Asia now, you hear a lot more about reconnectivity all over Asia and a sense of hope, right? That Asia and large extent Africa are recovering a voice, a cultural identity, you know, a strength that had uh, been taken away with the colonial times. Uh, and so the, this, is, this is a very uh, important time in world history. And then you're very right that in that context, the relation between China and India is critical. Uh, and, and we also know in 2020 that this, uh, this has been a flashpoint and it has been, uh, you know, it's functional, which is very bad for Asia and for the world. Uh, it's actually really regrettable because the fight is over what was initially a colonial boundary, right? The Mac Mahon line and some a legacy from the British presence. Uh, I, you know, and I'm convinced that down the line, there is not much gain for either side. And so I, I hope that some uh, wise heads could cool down and essentially find an understanding that, that there is, there's not going to be massive gain either side and there has to be a simple compromise. Uh, and then uh, indeed, they have huge mission if they can work together uh, in, um, you know, in, yeah, in co uh, managing this whole region. Uh, in the short term, it's difficult, but I, I, I do hope over time, I mean, both countries have very profound uh, geographical sense, historical sense. I, I believe that there is a sense, uh, I hear this from Chinese scholars and even some Indian scholars that I have been able to talk to, that there is a sense of dual tracking here, that uh, while the security game has been taken over by hawkish players, uh, you know, there is a sense at the same time that, uh, you know, that China and India are in a long term relationship. And uh, when it comes to economy, social issue, they're going to have to work it out. Right. It, it can't just be a, a fighting relationship. Um, so over time, um, I have hope. But the bridges are thin. Right. 
Uh, last time I, I gave a, a talk in India, that was in 2014, was on China-India relation. And I remember uh, learning from all the scholars in the room that there was very thin uh, knowledge base, right? There are not enough uh, students and scholars of China in India. We have, we have a famous one here, but uh, not enough. Uh, and um, and there are not enough uh, scholars of India in China. Uh, so there is a human base that thin, and, and so I guess GNU and here the center is at the heart of this. Uh, there is a lot of work, uh, and two super important uh, countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think the pandemic okay. is making some people believe that maybe Chinese have gone beyond Asian century to now focus more on Chinese century. Uh, but let me now invite uh, one of our very senior esteemed colleagues of my team, uh, Professor Nirmal Jindal. Uh, thank you, Professor Swan Singh. Uh, very interesting talk, Professor. Uh, very thought provoking. Uh, you know, uh, one of the observations and the questions that I have is about uh, COVID. You know, we all know that WHO was very late in declaring and, you know, how it was manipulated by China and stuff like that. But it is amazing that how countries like South Korea, Vietnam, they responded so early. And why USA failed to realize the intensity of the problem? Because uh, we heard that how uh, flights flying from US to China, there, the airline crew was not allowed to wear masks, you know, to take other kind of precautions because it was felt that the passengers would be scared or something like that. So it is one of the very interesting things to see how small countries, you know, responded so maturely and, you know, they uh, acted so effectively, you know, uh, despite uh, WHO, you know, declaring, uh, you know, pandemic so late. Uh, one of my questions is that, as you know, that the U.S. is going through uh, these presidential elections and uh, the uh, competition, this fight is very tough. Um, we are not sure who's going to win, uh, you know, at this point of time. But my question is that in case Joe Biden comes into power, you know, do you see any change in the U.S. policy in regard to the global cooperation and the role of the global institutions? Do you see that though the Chinese uh, are, you know, very aggressive and it seems that the policies are going to continue that way? Uh, but I just want to know that what would, what impact, uh, you know, the change in the U.S. leadership will have on the uh, issue of global cooperation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nirmal Jindal. This, this is, yeah, again, you put your finger on very, very important uh, aspects. Uh, the first question is a question that's very dear to me since I, I work specialized on East Asia. Uh, Actually, I, I was teaching Chinese politics, I was teaching other classes in January. On January 20, I came to uh, my class and I said, we have a global pandemic and we're probably going to shut down the university before March, but nobody knows it, right? So on January 20, the world had anything it needed to know to trigger uh, a complete uh, you know, a set of actions. And uh, only a few countries in East Asia did it. Uh, and, uh, and, and you're right, the U.S. didn't, right? And so if someone like me would, could know that, why, you know, why? Uh, and um, yeah, the, the reason was, you know, you, the reason are relatively simple. Number one, um, you know, all those countries, and we should add Taiwan, they uh, learned a lot of lessons from SARS and then for Korea for MERS uh, in 2009. And they literally passed laws on the book that allowed for, you know, the, and they even created the a special security center for pandemic. The, the rooms were set. The people for contact tracing were in place, were hired. So they, they were legally prepared and they were institutionally prepared. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, they, you know, because it happened in China, so they, they know how to watch China. Uh, and the most, for that, the most informed was Taiwan. I mean, even though, as we know, mainland China and Taiwan are you know, enemy brothers, right, or cousins, uh, you know, they, there is academic exchange between them. And uh, on January 13, top epidemiologists from Taiwan were in Wuhan. They visited the hospital. Uh, later, they did an interview with The Guardian, so we, we know what, what happened. And then they were told by the Chinese counterparts that there was human-to-human -human transmission on January 13th. 
Uh, they came back home January 14, and by the 15th, China, uh, Taiwan was declaring a total emergency. Uh, that was easy to watch, right? but Westerners don't watch the signs from Taiwan, Korea, Vietnam, and all this. Uh, in this case, they got it right, right? Um, and um, so there was, I guess, for Europe and US, there was Eurocentricism or US centricism, not knowing to watch signs from countries like, like this. Uh, and then they, in a way, there was complacency because they didn't suffer as much from SARS, from MERS. They, in a way, it's been a long time. There was complacency. There was lack of readiness. Um, and, um, and then I guess there is also cultural dimension. That is, all those Asian uh, places are used to wearing masks uh, culturally. So the country that actually pioneered the use of masks on a routine basis was Japan, apparently in the 50s. Uh, because there was after the war, there were there was a lot of uh, risk of, of uh, epidemics and so and flus and and all this. So they developed that uh, habit. Uh, the habit then later spread in you know, other places like Taiwan, Korea. And so they were they were there to start with. Um, and so there's a bunch of those factors. And so good good readiness, good governance, plus cultural support for the practices. And then there is trust in a way, trust in government on those things. And trust in science, uh, you know, in the case of Taiwan, it's quite extreme. The vice president of, you know, Taiwan is an epidemiologist. Uh, and, and in the case of Korea, very competent head of the Korean CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Uh, and that's KCDC leader, a woman, by the way, was led to, uh, uh, to basically call the shot on the science uh, aspect, right? Uh, so delegation, right delegation, a culture of delegation to experts and science, uh, that's been also part of it. And, and we see by contrast. So now in the U.S. is a particular puzzle because they had built a pandemic response team in the White House. Uh, and it's not just under Obama. It was even before that, right? It was a joint uh, bipartisan effort over years. And that had been dismantled uh, by the Trump administration, right? So they basically dismantled their own readiness and they cut the funding for CDC. So the CDC was even slow building the test, right? We had a faster test, more reliable in BC done by a small province than the US ever had in January, right? They, they had a lot of delay because uh, the CDC test initially uh, misfired. So yeah, so there's a particular <laughs> uh, error. When it comes to Biden, yes, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> It's hard to project ourselves yet there. The numbers are looking very tight. But assuming, you know, indeed there is still a chance that Biden wins, uh, it will be complete, uh, complete change. Uh, so in that sense, the U.S. is going through a big, big, uh, you know, it's, like, it's an extreme choice, right? Uh, not every democracy has this kind of situation. And it's a nail-biting result, and yet the choice is ma massive. Uh, because Biden has committed to join back uh, Paris Agreement, joining back the WHO, uh, you know, being part of multilateralism in general. Uh, and so that dimension will change dramatically. And you would probably see a functional G7, functional G20. Uh, what won't change is the hostility with China, but at least it may be done in a more multilateral, more rule-based way. Um, so, yes, uh, <laughs> It's an important election, there's no question. Thank you so much uh, of the people uh, trying to make an intervention or ask question. I see three people still on my screen. So before I go to Khurshid Ahmad Meer, I will invite before that Ms. Komal Bhadana. Please unmute yourself and make your intervention. Uh, good evening, everyone. Sir, it was a really great presentation. and. I'm a BCom on a student, so maybe, uh, you know, the kind of question I ask may, may sound silly to you because you all are, you know, really good in international relations. So, so my question is like, uh, in newspapers, we read a lot about US-China Cold War going on. So, so initially, you know, because I don't know much of, I used, don't used to know much, much about IR. So I used to think, you know, USA is like number one in the international relations. But I see that it, it's kind of, you know, declining. Its impact is declining. So what do you think, sir, ki, who is more strong in this U.S.-China, you know, cold war, cold war that is going on? 
and what kind of impact it will have in the in on us in long term you know the kind of cold war is going on and what will be its impact on us uh, you know uska influence jo kind of influence it decreasing in geopolitics so what, where do you see uh, you know us in the near future very good uh, komal your question is absolutely fantastic and Thank if you are reading newspapers uh, for china and us tensions you will know that canada has a very central role in, in those tensions so we are happy to ask that question to professor tevar gain and uh, we really wish to encourage you with your great question uh, professor tevar gain thank you uh, kumar badana yeah this is actually a super smart question <laughs> well done and you put your finger right on uh, something super uh, sensitive and important um so yes in in gdp term in a global economic uh, weight uh, the percentage from the us is going down right uh, there's no question in the mid 90s it was 30% now is going to a 23% so there was a significant uh, drop uh, in relative term not in absolute term uh but uh it's a complex process you know process of a relative decline of what we call a hegemon in ir is actually a very long protracted process you know over 50 years and so while the gdp share is going down the trade share is going down um on certain other indicators the us remains dominant for example 50% of global finance is still happening in wall street uh the dollar is still using 85% of global transactions uh and is still uh, more than about 60% of global reserves so if uh you know the us is able to uh put uh to implement its own sanctions at the global level because it controls the global payment system the swift system and it has to go through new york and therefore uh the us is able to say anyone who go through new york has to obey our sanction laws like on iran for example uh on education uh, you no know, top universities in the world remain clustered in the us uh you know silicon valley remains critical uh, even though there's bangalore as well um and so there's certain in the and then the military right the us military budget is still about half of the global military budget so uh so and military typically lags by a, a number of decades the global economic uh, reality even though military cannot be totally out of tune with the economy but let's say 20 to 30 years right so on the military side the us has dominance that will last longer than on the economic side uh but that creates a de- that's why it's a dangerous period uh and that's why if you're a realist scholar and there are some you know or if you're in the pentagon you you're going to think you know at some point uh you're going to have that natural thought and this is the so-called to see its trap you know that graham allison has written about and many others uh is so like, hmm the trend is downward for us even though we're resilient uh and now we have military supremacy in 20 years maybe 10 years we want uh and if a uh, conflict is inevitable with china we are better off now than later that creates a very dangerous situation right where there is <laughs> there is a potential incentive for fast conflict in order to stop rising china so the, all those dynamics are playing um of course at the same time there are nuclear weapons and that's why the graham allison thesis has its big issue nuclear weapons supposed to make such conflict impossible uh but they can happen by mistake you know like in south china sea or in the taiwan strait uh so we are in in the midst of all this tension uh, all this uncertainty uh testing human resilience <laughs> and capacity uh on the chinese side there is also so basically the us and china both overestimate their own role and capacity uh you know also it gives a time lag in human psychology if you're used to dominating uh and calling the shots and setting the rules uh it takes a generation to change the mindset right so there is always a human lag to the reality uh and so uh the american sense of dominating the world uh is probably higher than the reality the chinese side is the reverse uh they are rising fast they, and they tend to believe certain indicators over others so they could be an overestimation of their own uh, weight even though it's getting bigger um so we are in this complex game of psychology um 
so de decoupling, you're right also that decoupling, uh, at least if the US ends up having to decouple from the whole of Asia, then it's, and it's missing 65% of global growth, that cannot be good for the US economy. So then the challenge becomes how to decouple from China and not from Asia, including India, et cetera. But it's hard because China is very coupled with all of Asia. Uh, and so there is complex dynamic here. Uh, I, you know, when you study the transcript of what is happening in the US now and the, and the blow by blow US China trade war, what you find is, and you, you can read the book by Bob Woodward or by John Bolton and all those inside stories, uh, you find that uh, it's not a big uh, strategic master plan, right? There are a bunch of hunches that the president has, but it's really a, a messy process with a lot of uh, misperception and a lot of fast uh, decisions that are quite emotional. And then there is tit for tat response. So nobody is really sitting, you know, in like playing chess and thinking, okay, here are all the parameters. How do we manage this? Our economy is, you know, declining in percentage term, our military remains strong. How do we ma manage this? Because anyone's thinking strategically, I think the, the more reasonable game plan would be for the U.S. Uh, to translate its current dominance into a stronger global institutional uh, setup, and global rules, global institutions that will constrain China, even when China is stronger later. But that's not the pathway taken by the U.S. now. Instead, it's to erode the global institutions uh, and to go in a very, very tense uh, confrontation with China. The final unknown variable here is that there are many in the U.S. who think that, the, that China can collapse or China is weaker than it looks. Uh, that's a dangerous game, right? Because, in fact, nobody knows. Uh, there have been scenarios of potential economy collapse in China for three decades. Hasn't happened so far. Uh, there are factors of weakness and factors of resilience. Nobody knows, right, uh, if there is any potential of, of, of you know, a big, big economic crisis in, in, in China. What we do know is, uh, you know, P, uh, GDP per person is still low, medium in China, you know, $9,000. There is a huge pent-up demand for consumption. There is huge process of urbanization. Those forces tend to give support for continued growth. Uh, so China is not a developed country, right? So, um, and that's why we find a rebound now that's faster than expected. So complex dynamics and um, yeah, and difficult, difficult uh, to understand fully the U.S. game at the moment. But um, yes, thank you very much again, uh, Kumal. For thank you. Time. So you you elicited such a detailed answer. <laughs> so please. Uh, you are asking good question. Don't worry about it. Second, last question of the day, then we'll go to Khurshid Ahmad Mir. Please uh, ask your question. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It was an enlightening session. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes. Okay, sir. So my question is that in the conclusion, uh, what the speaker talks about that basically we need to rebuild the institutions, the global institutions, so that we could avoid this tragedy. But I'm I'm in a bit fixed that does it mean the institutions we have, whether at regional level or global level, they are now redundant or they are irrelevant or they have failed to live up to the commitments. So when we talk about rebuilding something, it means that what already existing institutions were there. They have failed to live up to the you know, expectations of this crisis. They failed to respond to this crisis because what I see is a leadership and institution uh, paradox in a sense or dilemma. Is that even if there are some good institutions which have put in dealing with such crises uh, like pandemics, uh, but at the end of the day, it again you know reaches to the bottom line that is the leadership. I mean. In leadership, what we witness is that at the end of the day, every leader, they say when, when we talk about Donald Trump or other leaders from here or there, they, they would again think about their own national interest. So with, while dealing this crisis, I think uh, the, the, the methodology could have been to think about the national interest. It would have been the cosmopolitan interest or something like that. Then comes the role of the civil society. So I am just trying to you know, just point out these things. When we talk about the rebuilding of institutions, does it mean that already institutions we have, whether at local or global level, 
they are no relevant or they have failed to live up to the expectation that's my view thank you khurshid let me uh, paraphrase his question to you eves he is saying since we spoke about post institutionalism now post institutions does that mean that the existing institutions have proven to be redundant and now when international leadership plans to rebuild new institutions would it be again dictated by national interest or can leaders go beyond national interest and for example involve civil society in constructing new institutions driven by this pandemic experience yeah so uh krishna that and swaran you uh yeah you hit the nail here very very interesting and and you uh, also hit uh, a particular internal tension within my own uh, analysis uh and essentially there are two pathways here by the way i think i used the word reform not rebuild but uh which is a, a little uh more gradual um so they they are really two pathways so when i mean the reform the institution i meant that first of all we have huge gaps right we we only we have nothing to deal with data we have nothing uh you know to deal actually with fast pandemic reaction we we so we have major gap and on climate we're very weak so there are many many uh, novel issues where our institutional setup is you know essentially is dated it goes back to 45 we haven't really uh, improved on on many of, of the structures second uh, there's always issue of inclusivity and the fact that those institutions uh over represents you know uh the interest of the victors of world war 2 and particular us and europe uh so those are traditional issues so we know that we can take the current institutions from a functional uh, role we have to make them more inclusive that to be legitimate everywhere they have to all actually uh, get more voice from civil society uh, globally and then they have to uh, deal with new problems uh so that's the reform plan and that's the um, you know that's in a way pathway number one, which is uh you know take what we have make it more inclusive legitimate uh and then uh you know build what we're missing you know all the the missing pieces and we have to diffuse the tension around data and around trade so there has to be a, a new kind of trade agreement of some kind right because currently the the trade relation between uh, many countries in China at least western countries in China is going down because of a clash over monitoring In fact they nobody can agree scientifically from a social scientific perspective if China respected the WTO rules and its accession protocol or not right the US is adamant that China cheated the EU actually says the EU says that China has respected the rules and the accession protocol but that the rules were insufficient and so China has exploited the gaps in the rules when it comes to subsidies and state owned enterprises and other things and has uh, therefore betrayed the spirit of the WTO agreement <laughs> but that's already very different right so the EU and US can't even agree on on a, an actual evaluation whether uh, the rules were broken and that points to a, a problem in monitoring rules uh because so much is now behind the border activity uh and also the you know in the case of trade there has to be a new uh, agreement uh where everybody can accept it right uh so that that's pathway number 1 but the pathway number 2 is should we have tr- president trump reelected um and should we be in a situation where first because of us veto and second because of rising nationalism everywhere we have a decrease support in many countries for global institutions then we have to that's where the post institutional <laughs> word comes in which is pathway number 2 can there be at least to you know hold the situation in an ad hoc way or minilateral or coalition way uh with um you know pathways that are different by each area some kind of flexible pathway to enable cooperation that's less rigidly institutionalized uh because that's better than any uh a pathway where we end up crashing into tit for tat conflict right and that where there is no more uh so when i say post institutional cooperation uh that's the second best and that's the you know if uh, the the cumulative effect of the veto of the us and 
of rising opposition in some key countries, uh, lack of support for global institutions, uh, make it hard to, uh, to have an institutional pathway. I'm an institutionalist. I, I personally believe that humanity has tried before. You know, the might is right, the conflict of nationalism and, 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 and power. Uh, that was the 19th century world. Uh, and this, is, this has not lead huma led humanity to a good uh, situation. Uh, plus, we face honestly in the human history the, for the first time truly global problems, you know, like climate change and pandemics and many, many others. If we can't find a way to cooperate, uh, we're going to be in big trouble and the future will not be a good future. And so we, we need a burst of innovative thinking. We have to find ways to improve human understanding and human cooperation in whatever way it works. So whether it's through, uh, you know, purely ideational normative level or whether we need actual institutions, uh, which I still believe we do, uh, we, we need to find ways to cooperate and have mutual empathy and mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have almost reached 45 minutes beyond our time and you can see professor's enthusiasm and energy is still there. So now we'll ask the last question by Dr. Silky Kaur. She had requested much earlier, but I kept her waiting because we wanted to accommodate as many people as we could. So I hope your questions are not already asked. So, you know, please go ahead and ask your question if you still have one. Thank you, sir. Uh, a very good, good morning, sir. And very good evening to all others. Thanks a lot, sir, for your wonderful talk. I have two very brief questions. Sir, my first question is that as the pandemic simulation war games, which prepare government for real world events, like in 2001, a simulation of a uh, smallpox bioterror attack called as Dark Winter exercise that preceded a series of US anthrax attacks by several months and many more other simulation exercises like this. And now in 2019, even 201, a fictitious simulation of a novel coronavirus pandemic, which was held in New York City last year, why the pandemic war games in that simulation failed to convince policymakers to act beforehand? And what are your views that how the policymakers and government should prepare and respond by not ignoring the warning of pandemic simulation exercises? And my second question to you is that how do you assess the role of global governance institutions like WHO and even local governments that failed in containing the pandemic of infodemic that was and is unusual tsunami of information, misinformation that made the pandemic worse. What steps the government and policymakers should take for future pandemics? Thank you, sir. So two questions. One on why simulation exercises on epidemics uh, Yes, the one that even happened last year in New York yes, sir. did not yes. help policymakers to prepare. And second, about how have these institutions, including WHO, failed in addressing infodemics yes. and what they should be doing? Thank you. I'm happy you still had two questions. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Silky Kaur, thank you very much. Those are very, very good questions. Uh, so for the first question, there, there is an easy answer which explains much of it, which is, uh, you know, most societies and political systems follow uh, routine or standard operating procedures and there's a lot of bureaucratic inertia. Uh, and in general, uh, so they do today what they did yesterday. Uh, and it's always very hard to convince, especially a big system or big country to spend a lot of money for something uncertain. Because, you know, if the probability is low based on the last 10 years or whatever, why would I today spend a lot of money and take it away from other things? Very hard to justify. So it's the problem of anticipatory governance. To do anticipatory governance, to govern in anticipation of something that's likely but not certain, uh, you have to break routine and you need to find uh, ways to override routine thinking. So there is that inertia in the system. On top of it, uh, 
leadership matters. So if you have good leadership, it overrides the routine and the bureaucracy. And that's what happened in, uh, in, in East Asian uh, countries. If you have bad leadership, uh, it, it goes, it accentuates the inertia. So even when the systems start to wake up, then the bad leader can push down the system. Uh, and we know uh, key countries that did just that. Uh, and it's not just one country, there is quite a few actually. Um, so those are two, two big lessons. And so in the particular case of simulation on pandemics, uh, it all depends. First of all, they can be uh, kept in the corner of the bureaucracy, not in the mainstream. So it depends which ministry is doing it and whether the leadership of that ministry is fully behind and then other ministries are not blocking it. So is it a cross ministerial exercise? Uh, and is it able to uh, impact how the bureaucracy is thinking? And then there is the political level. Uh, in many cases, those are niche uh, areas. They are kept as a niche uh, planning and they don't, uh, they don't translate into what uh, the bigger level does. Um, but in some countries, again, they do, right? So uh, some have taken it much more seriously. So it's very, very interesting. There's a lot of interesting research actually understanding why uh, you know, certain places like Korea, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, uh, and on and on, even Thailand reacted so much more, uh, so much more quickly uh, than others, and, and did those right things, overriding routine behavior. Um, so that's for the the first. Uh, for the the second, um, so we have to separate WHO and national level. The WHO is very poorly funded, right? The the full amount of money it gets is like four billion, and three quarter of that is. Uh, not its own money. No, it's money that's voluntary and it comes from a private sector foundations and uh, or like for a particular campaign, like smallpox or whatever. So, um, and it doesn't have, again, a rapid reaction system. It's mostly a system to coordinate data and coordinate long-term campaign like smallpox eradication. It, it's not set up uh, as a fast moving rapid reaction. It doesn't have operational rapid fire because the members control it, right? It's controlled by, it has a board and it's controlled by the World Health Assembly. The member states never want to give power to a global institution to intervene in their country, right? So they never gave that power. Uh, it is always a trade off between sovereignty and effective cooperation. And so, um, Member states uh, protect sovereignty and they nev never gave WHO the ability to, to uh, intervene rapidly. And in the, on top of it, in this case, it happens in China. And China is particularly sensitive about access to its own uh, you know, country uh, and blocked access on the ground. However, we need to mitigate that fact with uh, a, a few positive things that did happen in China, which is there has been a very uh, strong rise of the professional medical uh, system uh, and many doctors trained globally. Uh, and the medical class was excellent. They, they did identify as early as December 31. And they managed you know, by January 10 to sequence the genome of the coronavirus and make it available globally. Initially, there was even friction from the political system. Why did you do this? But the, the medical doctors were were very fast. And the data that came out, they published thousands of peer-reviewed papers out of this pandemic. And so there's a, a very strong professional expert class that grew in China. Uh, but the local government delayed for two, three weeks, right? So, um, and, and so that's not WHO's fault. They, in fact, we can say they, they're too close to China. They have no choice because wherever it is, right? If the pandemic next time is in country Lambda, if Lambda doesn't open the border to WHO, WHO can't do nothing, right? Uh, it's, it's only as strong as where the countries let it be. Um, infodemics is something at the local level. So WHO is again uh, calling on it, but they have no tool whatsoever to deal with it. At the national level now, uh, it's true that uh, there's high responsibility for countries that did not act rapidly. Um, and then they're on infodemic. It's a failure of governance of social media. And because essentially social media has re replaced our so uh, the newspapers and radio and TV as our main source of info. But unlike all those media, they don't have any quality control of data. And in fact, we don't in societies like, you know, democracies, we don't agree on what is what should be allowed in social media and what shouldn't be. Right. We, we don't have rules. We don't have agreement. And so crazy stuff is everywhere. 
and it reflects human psychology. In fact, it amplifies it. I think this is an issue of our, of our time, of how young social media is. Uh, eventually, humanity will find a, a way to deal with it, but uh, the, the stakes are very, very high. And by the way, this is common <laughs> everywhere. We used to laugh at China. They used to be terrified of rumors. So they go after rumors with their internet uh, uh, firewall. Uh, and we're like, ah, they're always afraid of uh, rumors because they're the CCP. But now we find that rumors are here with us too. Uh, and, um, and um, you know, they, they can have dangerous effects because if they lead people to act on the rumors, uh, that's dangerous, right? Uh, especially uh, when it comes to a pandemic where facts are facts, right? So you can live in this social media world where there's illusion. There is an alternative world there that looks real, but is not real. So... Uh, you know, reality at some point will bite, right? Uh, if, you know, if you have to put a mask to uh, survive and you don't because your attentive reality tells you it's a fake story, at some point, you're more likely to get sick, right? So, uh, yeah, complex questions now, but great questions. Thank you, Thank you so much, Professor Yves Tevagian. I admire your energy. And I have always believed that you are a walking encyclopedia on uh, especially East Asia, but also to a large extent on international relations. Your access to latest uh, publications and information always surprises me. So uh, you could see the response that we received from uh, so many questions. Uh, and I'm sure several of our participants had important takeaways from not just enormous details that you provided, but also very interesting inferences that you were able to draw from those uh, detailed information that you shared with us. Uh, we are delighted to have you. Possibly we'll request you again at some later stage to come back and continue Always this conversation with us. And we look forward to you know, that association with you in the long run. Uh, and I think uh, with that, I wish to thank my participants today, particularly because we've crossed about 50 minutes beyond our time that we one and a half hour normally say, but we know it will go up to maybe two hours, but it's gone way beyond. And I'm so happy that you could stay with us and your telephone is not yet buzzing from the media. It's about uh, 6.15 or 6.20 for you in the morning. So you will have a busy day. I can understand that part. But thank you so much for uh, sparing the time and uh, preparing such an excellent uh, uh, PPT and uh, giving us such detailed information and analysis on something which interests all of us as to what is pandemic doing to international relations, uh, because most of us are from international relations background. So deep and sincere thanks to you and look forward to our continuing association now. And thank you to all my uh, participants today. But for the formal uh, vote of thanks and for announcing the next week's speaker, I will request my colleague, uh, Professor Rina Marwa, to take the floor now. Professor Marwa. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Swaran, and thank you so much, Professor Tibigan. As uh, Professor Singh rightly mentioned, you know, that your knowledge and understanding and vision of economics to political science, to psychology, to sociology, uh, really surprises us. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, the way you dealt with US-China tensions and taking it through all the institutions from WTO to WHO and to uh, G20 and talking about the governance systems, uh, all the ramifications of the pandemic, and how it is so important to continue the cooperation mechanisms that we have, uh, you know, especially in this part of the world. And even as you yourself underlined that cooperative efforts are being taken place uh, for the vaccine, uh, which we hope will come soon so that we can be out of the rooms into real time conferences. But really, uh, you know, your lecture, it's, in fact, it's a half-day seminar, you know, one of the longest that we've ever had. 
uh, going Sorry. into 150 minutes and that also in the wee hours of the morning for you in cold winter. Uh, it, it's really amazing. So as Swaran said, you know, your energy, your enthusiasm and your responses, you know, you've been so quick to respond to all the varied uh, questions which came to you from different parts of the world, of course, and uh, really absolutely brilliant. And thank you so much. And we really look forward to the opportunity of having you once again on our uh, AAS platform of the association. Uh, really, thank you very much and have a wonderful uh, week and day ahead. Our next week's speaker is going to be our chairperson, actually. We are delighted to announce that Professor Wong Gangu, uh, who is now uh, over 90 years of age, lives in Singapore, uh, is a Chinese. Uh, so Professor Wong Gangu, Professor Emeritus, University of Singapore, former Vice Chancellor of Hong Kong University, and of course, a very well-known historian on China and overseas Chinese of global reputation. He will be speaking to us again on reading China's history to understand its contemporary concerns. And as Professor Tabergen also mentioned that China for itself considers that it is under siege. And we had uh, one webinar where we had Professor Han Hua, dear friend of Professor Swaran Singh. Uh, and and that, that was the title of her lecture, actually, and that China is under siege. So we are going to, again, understand in a different perspective what Professor Wang Gang Wu will uh, say to us. And this will be next Wednesday, just uh, two, three days before Diwali celebrations, <laughs> though they are muted. But we do look forward to your joining us at 11.30 in the morning next Wednesday. Thank you to all our dear participants, our very, very loyal friends and absolute, um, you know, it, it's a delight to always see you and have you with us uh, with your brilliant questions and so engaging. Thank you once again, Professor Tibigan. Thank you to our team, Ghazala, Barkha, Silky, uh, for being here and we look forward uh, to again having another engaging discussion next Wednesday. Good day. Thank Can you, you invite me to that one because uh, Dr. Yes. Wang Gong Wu is one of the wisest men on the planet. Absolutely. Much wiser than me. I, I would, uh, yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> we would be so happy to have you. Yes, of course. Uh, we will be sending you a mail. Yes, surely. You. We also have a long way to go to reach 90. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he's amazing. He gave a talk uh, last week at Harvard, which I, I attended. I woke up at five to listen to him, actually. Uh, and he is extraordinary because he's, he's also studied in many uh, places. Uh, and he has a very, very diverse understanding from multiple cultural perspectives and very profound reflection. So he's, he's astonishing. You know, he's very, but 11.30 in the morning for us would be late night for you. <laughs> All right. I will try, nonetheless. With time management, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in fact, long, some 25 years ago, I first came to know of Wang Kung Wu visiting Hong Kong University where one auditorium is named after him. That is the first time I knew that someone by that name exists. And then, of course, I was to also 20 years backwards get this fellowship where he was the chairman of Asia Foundation Committee. And of course, he's currently the patron of our Association of Asia Scholars. And as you just mentioned, his lecture to Harvard, he's still very active. And uh, me and Rina would remember once he told us the secret of his good health. He said before he sleeps in the night, he makes a plan of his day tomorrow as to how many things he has to do tomorrow. <laughs> and that keeps me really active and alert to so many things pending still for me to complete. Mm -hmm. And he's a living legend on Chinese history. So I'm personally looking forward to listening to him. Uh, 
and I will encourage most of youngsters who may not have heard him before to please join 11.30 next Wednesday and we will have him speak to us. Uh, with that, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Tevagyan. You've been really very nice to us with giving so much time. And now, of course, you can go back to US elections and see what has happened so far. <laughs> we all possibly will switch on televisions to see what is happening there. So thank you so much for joining today. And we look forward to, as I said, hopefully inviting you again next year, either physically or maybe if this channel continues online, then we'll continue online. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Yves, so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much.